Sportsman. Hi there. Come on in. It is Thursday night, November 1st, the year 2001. We're just two weeks away from the opening of uh, Michigan's third firearm deer season. We're going to talk about that on the show. We're going to talk about eating venison. We're going to talk about antlers. Uh, we're going to talk about bovine TB. We're going to talk about land rights and property ownership rights and some things that are really important issues to the practical sportsman. Stay tuned. Oh, have we got a delicious recipe here for meatloaf roll-up. I tell you, this is some of the best meatloaf you'll ever have. I get your usual pound or two of venison, mix in some green peppers, onions, you know, bread, seasonings, fresh garlic, your usual. And then you're going to put the egg mixture in there as well, like you would do for any of uh, your type of meatloafs. Once you get the egg mixture by hand, like you stir it up, mash it up, and then you're going to pound it out about an inch thick and lay a few pieces of Swiss cheese right across the top. And here's the key, the roll up. You're gonna roll up that roast into about the size of a, you know, a football or so. You're gonna pop it in the oven. And here's the kick. The topping is not your usual just ketchup. It's ketchup and pineapple. Towards the end, you're going to last 5-10 minutes of cooking. And you're going to put that across the top of your meatloaf. Stick her back in the oven. And I tell you, people are going to love it. They don't like meatloaf because everybody's mother thinks they make the best meatloaf in the world. And they have to eat it and they have to say they like it. Well, this one right here. What are you saying is, to me? <laughs> this, I, just, I was thinking, I'm not saying anything about anybody who makes meatloaf in my family. This is very, very good because it's, it's got some very, unique taste to it. Good. It's got something sweet in there. Mm -hmm. And it's in the cheese uh, and the green peppers and the meatloaf. Just, just excellent. Sweetness that comes through from the pineapple. This is one you don't have to lie about. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, this, I was wondering where this was going to go. <laughs> This cheese is terrific yeah, inside really here, just yeah. like Charlie said. It's uh, And I I could use maybe a little more ketchup, I, because I'm so used to having a, a lot of ketchup with mm -hmm. my meatloaf. Yeah, meatloaf. You know, because why is it meatloaf? Because it makes meatloaf really good. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> it makes it. And my family, all of them make the best meatloaf. <laughs> and, and I like it with ketchup. And you use Tabasco. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, but seriously, this one, yeah. the, the flavor of the venison just comes right, right through, Absolutely. and it's top drawer. Mm -hmm. Way to handle that, Charlie. Other <laughs> this is very good. Way to handle that on the family meatloaf. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Make no mistake about it, eating venison is probably the prime motivation of hunters in the state to go out and get a deer. Not all hunters want a big buck. Not all hunters are looking at the trophy. Not all hunters are looking at the challenge. They like to be outdoors and they like the meat that they bring home. But there's a question about the health of this meat. I mean, you've seen the headlines, bovine TB and all of these problems and concerns, and there are hunters who are afraid of getting bovine TB from a deer. Well, a couple years ago, I talked to DNR pathologist, wildlife pathologist Tom Cooley, who does a lot of these autopsies and, and deals with this day in and day out, and I think it's important that we listen to him again this year to find out how serious the TB problem is or isn't. This deer here, this was up in the Atlanta area. This is the tuberculosis era right. area, and everybody jumps to the conclusion that's what that is. Yeah, uh, really, this has should have nothing to do with TB. From the location of where it is, um, with tuberculosis, you do see two types of that. There's a respiratory part to it, and there can be a digestive part to it, depending on how the organism was taken in. The digestive part back when humans would get bovine tuberculosis that's what it was they were ingesting milk that was not pasteurized and so they were getting their abdominal organs abdominal lymph nodes affected and with those you would get like abscesses in those lymph nodes that type of thing with it's not going to look like anything like this uh, you're not going to get massive development of organs or anything like that or massive abscesses with 
even with that type of tuberculosis. That's not really the type that we've been dealing with or the part that we've been dealing with. It's the respiratory form that we have been seeing. We have had one fawn that did have some of the abdominal lymph nodes that were affected and that fawn would have probably picked it up through its nursing or through the, the close contact with the doe, but that would have actually been an ingestion at, rather than a, an, an, an inhalation or respiratory form. Is, is there any concern that people can catch tuberculosis from the deer? Well, there's always a concern. I mean, we can't say it can't happen. Uh, the likelihood of it occurring is ver going to be very slim just because you're not going to have the repeated chronic type exposures to an animal that is infected that you need to get transmission to occur. And that's why you know, we're telling the, the deer hunters, you're, even if you have an animal that is positive and you field dress that animal, the short period of time that you're exposed to those lungs, to that viscera, it's insignificant. And the likelihood of you catching, contracting tuberculosis by doing that field dressing is basically unimportant. You know, there's the chances of a, any infection occurring is so slim that you, know, you don't really need to be concerned about that. Now, if you're going to have constant day-to-day -day contact with those deer, live deer, and you're nose-to-nose -to, -nose to them and working with them, then it's, it's possible that, yeah, you could contract it that way. But none of our, of our deer hunters are going to have that type of contact. Uh, and that's how, like with the deer-to-deer -deer transmission, it's felt that that's how that transmission occurs is they are nose-to-nose, -nose, day after day, uh, all winter long, maybe all year long, depending on where they're feeding and uh, that transmission can take place much easier that way. Well, that's definitely reassuring to know that you really cannot get TB for all practical purposes, from field dressing a deer or handling a dead deer or butchering it or even eating it. Now, I know the DNR book says, and the Department of Agriculture has been saying, if you cook the meat thoroughly, you won't have any problem with TB. And that's absolutely true. But the other side of that coin is, if you eat deer meat raw, you won't have any trouble with TB either. It just is not in the meat. So that should reassure you. Now we can move on to the, you know, after the controversy about the TB, we're not even going to talk about baiting and things like that right now. But let's talk about the fun of hunting and the pressure to shoot big bucks. For the past couple of weeks, I've been commenting on this quality deer management proposal. They call themselves QDM, and they want to mandate some new legislation in the state, or at least orders through the DNR, that would, uh, well, as this article in the Detroit News said, limit the male deer kill in the thumb region. And it isn't just limiting the male deer kill, it's, it's the younger bucks, the ones with the smaller antlers. The people in quality deer management uh, say that these ones with smaller antlers somehow are not better and we would have a better deer herd somehow if more of the deer had larger antlers. Now, I don't quite get that. The letters I've received from QDM people, uh, I call QQQ, uh, QDM questionable quotes. For example, this one from Paul Plantinga from the Thumb area. He said the lack of mature bucks is one of the problems that QDM addresses, among others. The lack of mature bucks. I've never seen any data anywhere that says there's a lack of mature bucks, that hunters are over-harvesting the mature bucks. The lack by, you know, by whose standard? I mean, are the does complaining there's not enough mature bucks out there? Are, are the genetics, like, falling apart? Um, I don't know what the problem is. Uh, you know, and if it's not trophy hunting, which brings me to another quote, uh, Dave Steenheisen says, it's not about trophy hunting. We just want to let the year and a half old bucks go. Okay, they want to let the year and a half old bucks go. Why? Uh, the deer management that I've learned since back in the 1960s is that wildlife populations reproduce every year and they reproduce at a tremendous rate and you have to trim back the herd by taking what you can get and that just happens to be mostly young ones because that's mostly what's out there. So I don't get how they want to stop taking the young ones, how this is going to benefit anything. But Perry Russo, 
the president of the Thumb Area Branch, says we've been over-exploiting the yearlings and button bucks for so many years. Over-exploiting them? I don't get it. I've never seen any research that says they're being over-exploited. It goes on to say the health of the herds in the region is being hurt by the killing of too many young bucks. The health of the herd? I have never heard anything about this in all the years from any biologist that we have an unhealthy herd. Unhealthy how? What disease is it that this is causing? I don't get it. Questionable quotes. Now, I have, you know, if these guys want to have big trophy bucks out there, I have a trost proposal, and this is for maintaining more mature bucks. I propose only bucks six points and less can be taken. That way, the larger breeding bucks must be let go. And by taking only smaller bucks, the problem of the lack of mature bucks will be solved. Now, that makes sense to me. It also makes sense to some other hunters, too. I'm not going to sit out there at 150 yards away from a deer with a big spotting scope trying to count points on a deer when I only got a 20-yard opening. If he's got horns, he's, he's browning down. You know, it doesn't make sense. I can't eat horns, and I'm out there for the enjoyment of the woods, and if a deer comes along, that's fine. If it don't, that's fine too. I just like being out there. It gives me a legal excuse to be there with my gun, and if I fall asleep, that's good. But you like to eat venison? I like to eat venison. There's nothing wrong with it. I enjoy it very much. It's just the idea of I'm kind of tired of the trophy people determining what you and I have to do to be able to eat. And I don't appreciate the DNR saying... Oh, don't appreciate the DNR saying... Oh, man... Uh... You know, a lot of hunters aren't the only ones. Even the QDM people are, I guess, terribly dissatisfied with the DNR. Look at what they said in this article in the Detroit News. The state has failed miserably in educating landowners and hunters about managing the deer as a resource. In what way have they failed miserably? I don't get that quote. Uh, have they failed miserably by misdirecting us some way? I mean, there are too many deer out there, they say. They can't encourage hunters to take any more. I mean, they're giving away all the permits they can, and they can't get enough takers out there. So I don't understand how they are uh, miseducating the public. I don't think the DNR is miseducated. I think they were doing a great job back in the 60s and 70s and 80s. If anything, nowadays, they are miseducating the public, and I'll tell you how. They're doing it through politics. I have often said that the DNR is operating on politics, but get this, if you don't call this politics, I don't know what to call it. The DNR is preparing a survey that will be mailed to a thousand landowners and a thousand deer hunters in the area in December and January. And I just, I have trouble believing this. If 66% of the randomly selected hunters and landowners approve the plan, the department will mandate the four-point restriction for a five-year trial period on all private and public land in those three counties. They're talking about San Lac, San Huron, and Tuscola. That's what they're talking about in the article here, Plan Limits Mail, Deer Kill, and Thumb Region, although this is the blueprint for the rest of the state. This is where the quality deer people uh, want to go. Folks, when the DNR is sending out ballots to hunters to find out what the deer policy is going to be, that's not the Department of Conservation that I grew up knowing. Back in the 60s, the DNR stood their ground and they said, this is the biological management that we have to have for the state. And now, throw biology to the wind. They're saying, what do you want? We'll send that to a thousand landowners. We don't even know who they are, and they're going to tell us what the deer management policy will be. That is idiotic. If anything, that's a legislative function. The legislature is the body that operates on votes and social policies, not the DNR. So, of course, I have a proposal here, my own, for selecting quality deer managers. If we can do this for policies, I think what we should do is have a survey sent to all hunters in December and January. 
I think hunters can approve or disapprove of the jobs of the DNR director, administrators, local biologists, and conservation officers. And if 66% of the hunters approve of the DNR employees' work, they get to keep their job. The rest get fired. Huh? Makes sense to me. If we are going to dictate the policy, the supposed biological policy for hunting to the public, well, come on, let's vote on these DNR people as well. Maybe we don't like the job they're doing. Maybe we don't think what they're doing is healthy for hunting in the state. Oh, man. Well, last week uh, I also read a quote from Outdoor Life magazine. And this was, i, I got to go over this again because people have been calling and they're a little confused of, of who Bob Bender is. Bob Bender, the article said, is appointed by Governor Engler to head the state's bovine TB eradication task force. And he said that a vastly increased kill in the TB zone still didn't, didn't do the job. They want to bring the deer numbers below 20 deer per square mile. Now, Bob Bender is not a legislator. He's not king, but he was just running this idea out there to see what people would say, I hope. He said, I think we are reaching the point where we are going to need a law that lets us go onto private land over the objections of the owners and kill deer. Whether we can get that or not, it's going to be very unpopular politically, Bender says. And it's important for you folks to know that this is not even a proposal yet in the legislature. I mean, I don't think they would dare do that. I don't think there's enough communists and fascists and socialists and all that there to uh, vote something like this that would turn property rights upside down, especially over deer hunting. Oh, unbelievable. Well, Jim Lee is a dairy farmer uh, outside of Grand Ledge. I mean, you just heard from little Jim. Uh, let's hear from big Jim here, who's a dairy farmer and has some opinions about this proposal. You know, we, we're, we're supposed to pay our taxes and we're supposed to abide by everything, but the, the, the Michigan Department of Agriculture says that if we have a herd, if our cows get TB, they can just come in and take them away. And then now the, the, the DNR says they can just come in and take the deer away if they want to. And I just wonder where our say is, you know, what, where, where, what did we earn out, out, of, out of everything? We're caught in both long arms of, of the government, and I just wonder, you know, I don't think when, when you were talking last week about how the, the DNR thinks they might be able to come in and go on your farm, you know, we've got three chunks of ground, and out of all of them, each one took at least two generations to pay for, and there's a lot of hard work. And, I would sure hate to think that all of a sudden somebody else is going to decide who is going to manage our, our land for the deer, you know. And I just, I just don't know what it's coming to. Well, I don't know what it's coming to either, but I tell you what, I believe in fighting for our constitutional rights because we've got to hang on to them now. We can't let what's happening in the world, I don't care whether it's in the Middle East or in the Northeast or in the TB zone, we cannot let this erode the rights and liberties we have here in America. I feel very strongly about that. Last week I reported on DNR tickets up in the uh, Manistee River area, Tippy Dam, for attempted snagging, which is sort of like attempted trespass. You know, yeah, you were thinking about trespassing, weren't you? I know you didn't step over there. Well, I got a call from a woman uh, who says she and her husband work in law enforcement, and they were told by some people up there that fishermen were ticketed for, get this, improperly stringing their fish on a stringer. Now, aside from this woman in law enforcement, I don't have verification of that, but if any of you got a ticket for improperly stringing your fish on a stringer, please send me a copy of that. I want to see what this is all about. This, uh, well, as Jim Lee said, I just don't know what it's coming to. What is this project? This is a javelina or a peccary, whatever you want to call it. It's the only piggot that is actually native to North America. 
And it's actually the southern part of uh, North yeah, America. Yeah, Arizona, Texas, uh, probably a few other states. And you're just stitching up the final? Yeah, sewing up the back and making sure I got good glue inside it. So you actually, you glue the all the hide to it yeah, as well as stitching it? I want the, the skin to stick to the mannequin. Um, that way it doesn't, it helps control a lot of the shrinkage and holds the skin where you want it. What's this deal over its face? That's just a bag. I can't take, put the bag over its face because I haven't got in here. I haven't positioned all of Oh! I want to oh. be able to get back inside here and, and put some glue in there and then do all my detail work. And I, I try and save that till the end. So I, I like to just put the bag over to stop the skin from drying out. Mm hmm. Hmm. Interesting. I've decided to take my own advice on choosing a place to hunt. I've told you that if you want to catch big fish, go to where the big fish are. If you want big bucks, go to where the big bucks are. Well, I'd like to hunt pheasants like I did 20 years ago, so I'm going where the pheasants are, South Dakota. I'll be back before next week's show. We've had one firearm deer season in September and one in October. The third firearm season will open on November 15th. Now, that used to be the only firearm deer season See how a practical sportsman from Lansing made his UP deer camp out of an old trailer, a pickup cap, and some odds and ends. And find out some things about deer antlers and rubbing and velvet that I bet you didn't know. And learn what to do if anybody, including a conservation officer without a warrant, trespasses on private land while you're hunting. All this and more coming up this week, right here on Public TV. You're not going to have the repeated chronic type exposures to an animal that is infected that you need to get transmission to occur. That's why you know, we're telling the, the deer hunters, you're, even if you have an animal that is positive and you field dress that animal, the short period of time that you're exposed to those lungs, to that viscera, it's insignificant and the likelihood of you catching contracting tuberculosis by doing that field dressing is basically unimportant. You know, there's the chances of a, any infection occurring is so slim that you, know, you don't really need to be concerned about that. Now, if you're going to have constant day-to-day... -day